Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. First and foremost, yes, I now have pink hair. The clinical site that I'm at allows colored hair, so I figured might as well just do it while I have the chance. Who knows what my next clinical site will allow or what my future job will allow for that matter. So I just took it and ran with it. I just wanna point that out before people start asking me why I have pink hair in the comments. But that's not what's important. What's important is the case at hand. So the case that I have for you guys today is a very recent one, but the details surrounding it are very frustrating and I want to come out right and say from the very beginning that I do believe that this case involves a very significant cover-up. But before we get into it, I just wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Vessi. Vessi is a new sponsor to this channel and I couldn't be more excited. Vessi offers comfortable, stylish, everyday sneakers that you can wear even in the winter or rainy weather. A lot of you who follow my Instagram know that I love hiking, I love just being outside in nature, but to me one of the absolute worst things that happens on hikes is when you step in a puddle or it unexpectedly rains and the trail gets all wet and my shoes get wet and then water leaks into my shoes and get my socks all wet and then it leaves me completely and totally uncomfortable for the rest of the hike. Honestly, the feeling of wet feet and water leaking into my socks bothers me so much that sometimes I just want to turn around and leave the hike and go home because I absolutely hate walking around with nasty wet feet. With the upcoming wet weather and snow season, waterproof sneakers are a must. Or if you're in Arizona like me where it's not usually very rainy, cooler weather does mean more hiking and more chances that you'll get wet or step in a puddle while on the trail. Or if you like hiking up in Flagstaff, there's always different streams and grass that you could be walking on that gets wet. It gets much wetter up there and it snows more. So no matter what you're doing, I'm definitely gonna be walking around in wet weather or snowy weather and again waterproof sneakers are a must. I also just moved to a new location as most of you know if you watched my previous video or as you can tell I'm obviously in a new location and in this new house the grass in the yard it gets so wet in the morning and I like to go out and run around with my dog in the morning and before my shoes and socks were always getting wet which is so annoying especially as I'm trying to get ready for work and I usually do the running around right before I go out, but now Vessi has me covered with that too. Let me tell you, Vessi has made my life so much easier. Their shoes are 100% waterproof and snowproof, and they're an everyday sneaker, so if I end up having to pack lightly for a hiking trip, which is what I normally do, I don't have to worry about bringing my everyday shoes and then also packing my hiking shoes, which takes up so much space in my backpacks. I can just wear my Vessies to go out and about and then go hiking or working out or walking around or whatever else I decide to do that day. And they're super easy to keep clean, which is exactly what I need because my shoes always get so dirty so quickly and I hate the look of a dirty, muddy shoe. All you have to do is rinse them off in water or throw them in the washing machine. And as many of you know, I am a vegetarian and I care a lot about sustainability and Vessi has me covered in that aspect too. Vessies are sustainably made using a knitting process to make the shoes, which creates less material waste, less water waste, and they don't use any animal byproduct, making them completely vegan. Vessi shoes have honestly saved my life from nasty, wet, soggy socks. Check them out yourself by clicking the link down below and using code Rachel to get 25% off of each pair of Vessi shoes. Free shipping is also available to to the countries listed here. Thank you again so much to Vessi for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the suspicious death and possible cover-up of Elijah Snow. Elijah Snow was born August 30th, 1985 in Fort Worth, Texas to parents Ronnie and Alicia Snow. He grew up in Arlington, Texas, and was known to love playing soccer with family and friends. He went on to attend Tarleton State University in 2010, earning his nursing degree. Elijah's father was actually a firefighter, and he unfortunately died in a training accident in 1985. So 
Elijah knew that being a firefighter was his calling, so he followed in his father's footsteps and took a job at the Arlington Fire Department, serving as an apparatus operator. He was described as being incredibly brave, and he was committing to serving the people of Arlington. In 2006, Elijah met a woman named Jamie, and the two hit it off immediately. They became best friends until they realized just how much love they had for one another, Everyone who knew them said that you could tell how much they loved each other just by seeing the way that they looked at one another. They were described as a dynamic duo who were just perfect for one another. Jamie would often say everyone needs an Elijah because she found her soulmate and believed that everybody else should meet theirs too. By June of 2011, the two got married and their love continued to blossom. Then, by 2015, the pair had their first daughter, Aubrey. Everyone who knew Elijah said that his little girl absolutely had him wrapped around her finger and that he was an amazing father from the moment Aubrey was born. It wasn't long before they welcomed their second daughter, Hannah, into the world in 2016. He flourished in his role as a dad. He was always smiling so big on the sidelines, watching his daughters play at their soccer games, gymnastics meets, and swimming lessons. He was so proud of his girls and who they were growing up to be. He would do absolutely anything for his two girls, and all he wanted in life was to make them as happy as he possibly could. Now, in the early morning hours at around 3 a.m. on July 18th, 2021, Elijah and his wife, Jamie, boarded their flight to Cancun, Mexico to celebrate their 10th wedding anniversary. At around mid-morning, they arrived at the Royalton Chic Resort, which is an all-inclusive adult-only resort at the shores of Uvero Alto Beach. Of course, they were hoping for a romantic vacation just to spend some time one-on-one -on -one together as a couple and celebrate their entire decade of love and commitment to one another. And this hotel seemed to be the perfect place to do that. They spent their first day at the pool, sipping on margaritas all day, before going back up to their room to clean themselves up before going to dinner. They ended up eating dinner at an Asian restaurant located in the hotel. Here, they had their meal, they washed it down with some sake, which is a Japanese liquor, or if you're American, you probably know it as a sake bomb. After this, they headed to a bar, which was located on the first floor of the hotel. Here, they continued to drink for a bit. However, at around 9.30 to 10 p.m., Jamie was tired and she was ready to call it a night. She wanted to head back up to the room because Jamie was pretty tired at that point. They had been up so early to catch their flight and they had been drinking all day, so Jamie just wanted to go upstairs and go to bed. But but Elijah wanted to stay at the bar and have one more cocktail before calling it a night. He wasn't as tired as his wife was because he's used to a firefighter schedule, which is typically 24 hours on. So sometimes you're awake for the full 24 hours. Sometimes you get woken up several times per night. So Elijah wasn't too tired after being up for so long because he was pretty much used to it. But Jamie is not used to this schedule as most people aren't. And when she's tired, she just wants to go to bed. So Jamie was perfectly fine with her husband saying for one more drink because she knew that the bar closed closed at 11 p.m. due to the new COVID rules. So she knew that her husband wouldn't be too far behind her when she went off to bed. So she went back up to the room and passed out pretty much immediately. But when she woke up in the middle of the night at around 4 a.m., she quickly realized that her husband had never come back up to the room to meet her. But her initial reaction wasn't totally panicked. They had made some friends while they were out at the bar or at the pool sometime during the day. So she thought that maybe he had just gone off with one of the friends to hang out with them and then just fell asleep on their couch or something like that. But she still got up and started looking around for him and asking around to see if anybody had seen him, but she couldn't find him anywhere. After realizing that he was nowhere to be found by 5 a.m., she went and posted a message on a private Facebook group that she had joined that was made just for these hotel guests, and she alerted the royalty and security about him being missing. They told her that they would alert the staff and that they would get back to her as soon as they could with any updates. After this, all morning, she just continued to look around for him. She went all over around the hotel that she could think of. She went to the beach thinking that 
Maybe he was just gonna be out on the beach, hanging out in a chair by the pool. At this point, he didn't have his phone on him because he had left it in the car. So there wasn't really any way that she was able to call him or try and locate him based on the GPS in his phone, which I'm guessing is like a find my iPhone type of thing. According to Jamie, by 8.30 a.m., the security had searched around for a little bit, but she noticed that there wasn't really much concern for her missing husband. So she went Went ahead and called police. But then by 11.30 a.m. on July 19th, she met up with the police officers who delivered her the absolutely worst news that she could have possibly imagined for this situation. Officers told her that her husband had been found dead. So it turns out at around 7 a.m. that same day, a gardener showed up for work at the Sunset Resort, which is another hotel located right next door to the Royal Chic, and noticed that a man was protruding from a tiny window of a locked employee bathroom located behind the stage of an outdoor theater. The man was found dangling from the window, which was about two feet above the ground. It appeared as if he had died at around 10.30 p.m., about an hour or an hour and a half after the couple had parted ways, and about an hour after the theater's final stage when the doors would have been locked. And of course, this man did come back as being a 35-year-old Elijah Snow. So Mexican officials went to Jamie to show her a picture of Elijah's ID to show her that this was the man that they found. But this was the very first really weird thing that happened because she knew that she never gave his ID to hotel staff or literally anybody else. The only thing that they had seen was their passports. They never had his ID. So she really didn't know how they even got this picture of his ID. They also wouldn't take her to Elijah's body where they found him to see the exact condition of how he was found. And despite her begging and begging and begging, they would not show her how he was found. They then took her to the hospital to identify his body but once again, they would not show her anything. She had to beg Mexican officials to even see a picture of his face, and they made her pay $100 just to see the picture of his face. They pulled up the picture of his face on a computer screen, let her basically take a glance at it, but wouldn't even let her save the picture or take a picture of the picture on her phone. She then had to pay an additional $100 to see any more pictures of his body, and then another $100 to take a picture of these pictures to send to her family. She ended up paying Mexican officials upwards of $600 just to identify her husband's body. She straight up said in an interview with Dr. Phil that this money was bribes to police because she needed to see her husband's body. She needed that closure because she was still in complete disbelief and denial. So initially, police thought that this was just a situation of a drunken mishap of a man trying to squeeze through a window and just got stuck there and died. Right away, they completely ruled his death as an accident. However, there was a lot of different things in this case that made this not so likely. First, the window is in an area that is not readily visible by any guest in that area and it just so happened to be in an area that surveillance videos do not capture. I'm now putting up a map of the two hotels where everything is located. So you can see in the top left corner, the two hotels are right next to one another. You can see in the back of it is a grassy area, and then you see the theater where the employee bathroom is located. Then you can see this window, which is around two square feet, and is sort of hidden behind a concrete slab. It's pretty close to the ground and he was found with his torso in the window so his head and shoulders and arms were all outside and then his hands were on the ground with his torso, legs, and feet inside. So to them, it looked like he had tried to climb into the window feet first but got stuck because it's such a tiny window. The other thing about this window is that found next to the window, there was a piece of plywood and a crowbar. So before he had allegedly climbed into this window, the window was covered with a piece of plywood that was nailed into the wall. So the plywood would have had to have been pried off with this crowbar before entering the window. So what Mexican officials want you to believe at this point was that Elijah, in his drunken state, 
found this random wall with a piece of plywood on it, grabbed a crowbar from who knows where, and then pried it off to reveal this tiny hole that he just knew led into a bathroom before shoving his body into it and then getting stuck. So already just where he was found is pretty suspicious. They weren't even in the area of the hotel for 24 hours before he would have gotten into this window. It's in a very closed off secluded area that's not easy to access at all. It's not somewhere where a tourist is just gonna walk off and wander to. Police said that maybe he was looking around for a bathroom to go into, but even so, there's absolutely no way that he would have even known that this was a bathroom. You guys can see the picture. It literally looks like a tiny square in a concrete wall. He wouldn't have known that it was a bathroom, especially if it was covered in a piece of plywood. And again, he didn't even have his cell phone with him at this point, so he definitely didn't have a flashlight or any other source of light to spot this tiny dark hole to crawl through because the area was not lit at all. It's really suspicious to think that he was walking around in complete darkness and somehow out of nowhere was able to see this tiny two square feet hole in a random wall. Plus he is a man and not to sound sexist or say anything out of line here, but I don't know any man who's so desperate to pee that he opts to crawl through a tiny dark hole into a room that may or may not even be a bathroom rather than just go to one of the many open bathrooms in one of the bars or restaurants located right there or take a leak on a wall on the side of a bar or even pee in the sand. I know plenty of men who have admitted that they just whip it out and take a whiz on the side of a building or in a trash can if they really have to go and aren't near a bathroom. Let me know what you guys think. Obviously, I'm not a man, but even I would rather squat down in the water or on the sand to pee than crawl through some mysterious dark hole and just hope that it's a bathroom. Even if I was inebriated by alcohol, I still know how to find a bathroom and I definitely know that I shouldn't be crawling through random holes. So already all of those details just simply don't add up to this being a drunken mishap. The other thing that just doesn't make sense with this entire situation is the fact that Elijah is literally a firefighter. He is trained to navigate through tiny spaces and squeeze into tiny little tunnels for his job. His family does not think that given his training, he would randomly decide to shove his body into this tiny space knowing that it's far too small for him to get into. He would have known that this was way too small because again, he has the training to know where he can and cannot squeeze into and then get into this tiny hole to the point where he suffocates and isn't able to get himself out, which again, even if he did somehow get himself into that situation, he would have been able to get himself out because again, he is literally trained to do so. I mean, it is out of character for him to go and wander off and try to get into somewhere he's not supposed to be in the first place, but even beyond that, if you wanna argue that this intoxication made him act out of character. His firefighter training doesn't just fly out the window at that point. He's been a firefighter for over 10 years. At that point, it's pretty much muscle memory. He honestly seems like the last person that would find themselves being stuck in a tiny hole. Then I also want to mention that him and his wife go to Mexico almost every year for their anniversaries and they have never wanted to leave their resort. Jamie said that she was always asking Elijah if they could go into town or go on excursions or do the touristy things, but Elijah was actually the one that was always cautious. He was always saying that they were paying to stay at a nice hotel, so they should just stay there. Again, he was even more cautious than Jamie was about leaving the resort. So again, it would be extremely out of character for him to just go and wander off somewhere completely out of where they're used to after not doing so for the past 10 times that they've been there. And I guarantee they've drank almost every single time they go. And maybe they've even been more more tired or more intoxicated and he's never done that before. It just doesn't make sense that after all of this time of being cautious and not wandering off and not even wanting to leave the resort during the day that he would just 
decide to wander off on his own. It just doesn't make absolutely any sense. So the next thing that came out in this case was the autopsy performed on Elijah's body. So their medical examiner determined his cause of death to be mechanical asphyxia due to thoracic abdominal compression. So basically saying that the weight of the torso and being unable to move prevented him from being able to breathe and that is how he died. They said that his feet dangling could not support the weight of his upper body when he got stuck. They also mentioned that he had absolutely no other injuries on his body and absolutely nothing else that could indicate that foul play was involved. However, Elijah's stepdad, David, flew into Mexico to look at the condition of his body himself and let me tell you, it absolutely did not match up with what Mexican authorities were claiming whatsoever. After police released Elijah's body to the local funeral home, Jamie and David went there themselves to examine his body and take pictures of what they found. Jamie had the absolutely horrific job of moving around her body herself and taking pictures of his injuries. Now, the photos of what I'm about to discuss are available online if you want to look at them. Obviously, I've looked at them myself and honestly they aren't the most graphic pictures that I've ever seen but I don't really want to include them in this video just in case anyone is sensitive to that type of thing and honestly out of respect for his family I think they were the ones that posted them and gave permission for them to be out there but it is a deceased body and I don't really feel comfortable sharing those images on this channel so if you want to see them, they are available with a quick Google search. So the very first thing that Jamie and David noticed about Elijah's body was that there was a ton of bruising all over that just was not consistent with climbing through a window. He was found to have a bunch of cuts and bruises on his forehead and it appears that there was some sort of cylindrical indentation on his forehead as well. There were bruises all over the back of his head going down his neck and then all across his upper back and then a ton of very dark and deep bruising all over his thighs and lower legs. To Jamie, and a lot of people have agreed, and I personally agree myself, the bruises look like somebody was kneeling on his neck and then the ones on his leg look like he was kicked by a shoe. Just based off of these bruises and other injuries, it looked like Elijah had been very, very badly beaten before his death. He was also found to have a bunch of dirt all over his face and mouth. The blood was also not pooled in his feet, which is what you would expect if someone had died hanging in that position. Once your heart stops beating, the blood's just gonna go to wherever gravity is pulling it, and if he had died from hanging out of a window where his feet are obviously being pulled by gravity, that's where the blood is going to go as well. So his family very, very adamantly believes that he was mugged, kidnapped, beaten, and killed, and then whoever was responsible shoved him through that window to either try and hide the evidence or for another reason. So Jamie kind of came up with a situation that she thinks is possible for what happened to Elijah. Jamie thinks that after leaving the bar that Elijah went for a walk on the beach. Then someone came up from behind him and hit him with something, which is why he had all that bruising on the back of his head and neck. They believe that he was held down and kicked and maybe someone was again kneeling on his neck or on his upper back, maybe between his shoulders. Hence again, the bruises all over his upper back and then the bruises that were on his leg again look like they could have been caused by a shoe. So this could mean that someone was stepping on him or kicking him while he was laying down or any number of other reasons. So she thinks that he was mugged and beaten and then either tried to get away by going through the window and getting stuck so maybe the people brought him over there to do the beating because you know they don't want to be seen by anybody else and then he saw that as an opportunity and went through the window to try and escape them or more likely that someone who knows the area pried off the wood to put him in there and then he got stuck the intention probably was not to have him stuck in the tiny window but someone who does not have this firefighter training won't necessarily be able to gauge 
how much of a person can fit through a certain sized hole. So they could have had every intention of just hiding him in that employee bathroom, but then he got stuck, so they left. Or they believe that after he got stuck that he was still trying to fight back because maybe he was still alive and that he was suffocated and killed by somebody else and that's why he had the dirt all over his face. It could have been that or maybe he was kicked in the face and they had dirt on their shoe or something along those lines. It makes absolutely perfect sense to me that if he was beaten, that it would have been at the hands of an employee or somebody who knows the area very, very well. He was in a literal locked employee bathroom. Only employees would know where that is. Plus, this just so happened to be in an area where surveillance videos didn't pick up. The only people that would know where the cameras do and do not record are, again, employees. But even beyond that, the family have asked the hotel for any surveillance video that they have. They want to see if they can maybe spot him at the bar when he walked off the direction that he walked off in, if he left with anybody, if maybe he got into an argument with someone before he left, or if anything else happened before or after he left the bar. But the hotel refuses to release any surveillance video that they have. So the family has absolutely no idea of anything that could have happened leading up to his death, and I'm sure police aren't doing anything to help them with getting that surveillance video. If it truly was an accident, why doesn't the hotel want the family to see it and just confirm it for themselves? They could literally show them the video and say, look, he walked off by himself. Nothing else happened. You can literally see him walking in that direction. Look, you can see him looking very intoxicated and disoriented. But the fact that they don't want them to see what happened just before he died is very telling. Then when Mexican authorities returned Elijah's items back to Jamie, they gave her back his wallet, which still contained his credit cards, his driver's license, his fire department ID, his concealed carry license. But apparently, according to Jamie, there was $100 that he had in his wallet that was missing when they returned the wallet. They also have yet to return the rubber wedding band that he wears when traveling, or the clothes that he was wearing the night that he died. So to me, that does support the theory that maybe he was mugged that night. Either that or the authorities grabbed the 100 out of the wallet before returning it. We know that there's a possibility that the authorities went through his wallet before they even told Jamie that her husband was found because somehow they had this picture of his ID, which there was no other way they could have gotten hold of. It honestly wouldn't surprise me if they took his money either. We know that the authorities down in Mexico can be very corrupt and they don't really have much consideration for their own people, let alone tourists. It's actually a very commonly known thing, at least in Arizona, that you should be very, very careful when you're around Mexico authorities because they just, they basically just want your money. They very well may take your money after pulling you over. I've heard lots of stories of people getting pulled over and they just want your money right then and there. They say don't carry too much money because they're gonna want all your money, but if you have a 20, they'll take that and let you go. But if you have no money, I know someone who actually got detained for 24 hours just for driving in Mexico. Tell me if I'm wrong in the comments. I totally could be off base here. I'm just going off of personal stories that I've heard, but I've been told by a lot of people that if you are pulled over by a Mexican police officer, just bribe them and they'll most likely let you go. That's just what I've heard living in Arizona. They say that if you ever decide to drive into Mexico to go to Rocky Point, which is one of the big tourist places near Mexico, or something like that. Plus, we know that there have been a lot of other cases of tourists being killed in Mexico and having their cases just not being investigated by Mexican authorities. According to the State Department's database, 149 American citizens died in Mexico in 2020, and the most common cause of death for this was homicide. But even that statistic can be completely off because Again, we can see by this case that in my opinion and in a lot of other people's opinions, 
that this death was ruled an accident when it clearly isn't. So this could add to the number of homicides and it could mean that there's a lot of other cases that aren't being listed as homicides because of the corruption. Not saying that's true for every single case, but as we can see now, not even all the cases that are homicides are labeled as homicides, in my humble opinion. To me, in my opinion, allegedly, this case is a very obvious one of police just wanting bribes, not wanting to investigate anything, and just leaving a family to suffer. The fact that Jamie had to pay an absurd amount of money just to see her husband's body and identify him, that's proof enough. The fact that they came out and said he had absolutely no other injuries on him just to be found with all of these bruises, it's not even like it was a couple bruises that could have easily been missed. No, it was very obvious, deep, dark bruises and cuts all over his body. All of this just points to a police cover-up. Jamie and the rest of Elijah's family have not given up in their fight for Elijah. They know with absolute certainty that Elijah was murdered and Mexican officials are trying to cover it up. They have spoken to tons of media outlets and went on the Dr. Phil show, as I mentioned earlier, to spread awareness about this case and try to get more people involved. The family has created a changed out org petition that is requesting that President Biden requests that the Mexican government allow the FBI to review and assist with the investigation into Elijah Snow's death. The petition states, quote, the time has come for our government to stand up to Mexico and proclaim that this is no longer acceptable. We respectfully ask President Biden to act on behalf of Elijah and all other American citizens that are missing or have been killed in Mexico. Families of these citizens deserve answers. So there is a call for the Biden administration to try and work more closely with other law enforcement agencies so that there's more communication and continuity for investigating these crimes. Neither the FBI nor the Arlington police can do anything to report on this case, so the family is just being left in limbo. It is such a frustrating and heartbreaking thing that the family has to go through. They just have to sit here knowing that their loved one is murdered, knowing that Mexican officials refuse to actually investigate this case. They have to sit there and witness all of these horrific injuries that he suffered and be told that he died after getting stuck through a window. I've looked into a lot of cases that involve suspicious deaths. In fact, we just covered the case of Tanner Ward, which is definitely a very suspicious death for a lot of reasons. But honestly, I have never seen a more obvious case of someone being beaten and killed and police just wanting to cover it up. I think it's so disturbingly blatant what's going on here. So I desperately hope for the sake of Elijah's family that something can be done to investigate his death and find out who ripped this man away from not only his children and his family, but his community and the people that he saves every single day. It just makes me so, so sad that this man dedicated his life to saving the lives of others, putting himself into life-threatening and dangerous situations just to keep the members of his community safe, only to have his life ripped away from him at the very young age of 35 years old. His babies miss him. His wife is devastated and she will never be the same without him. Their family not only lost their husband, their father, or their son, but they have to figure out everything else by themselves and they have to investigate everything themselves. They have to advocate for him because they know that nobody else will. This isn't a situation where they just have to sit by and wait for police to gather all of the evidence because they know that police aren't gathering anything. They're not putting in a single ounce of effort to do anything for Elijah. In fact, they're putting in more effort, in my opinion, to cover it up than they are to investigate it. I can't even imagine the incredible amount of grief and stress that this entire thing has put on the family. The family has also set up a GoFundMe account to help support the family financially and continue the investigation into his death. Please, if you have absolutely anything to spare, donate to their GoFundMe. I will be donating some of the money generated from ad revenue on this video as well, 
but if everyone even donated one dollar, the family would be so much better off. It must be so difficult not only to have to figure out how to raise a family with this loss, but with the loss of income. I certainly hope that the fire department is helping out. I hope that there's some sort of life insurance policy or payout to the family. But even with that, Jamie's on her own right now. I don't know if she works. I don't know if she was a stay-at-home mom, but it doesn't really matter. She's on her own now. She has to build herself and her family back up from the absolute ground, and that is very expensive and difficult to do when you just completely lost an entire source of income. So again, please, if you have absolutely anything to spare, donate to this family in need. Both the GoFundMe and the change.org petition are listed below in the description box below as always. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. And now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you think that this is a cover up by police or do you think he really just died from getting stuck in that window? Let's discuss in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and click the link down below and use code Rachel to get your pair of Vessies $25 off. Also, don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions over to rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.